for. Uh, I'd like to cover chapter 12, environmental protection and negative externalities. Um, we talked a little bit about the economics of pollution, command and control regulation, market-oriented environmental tools, benefits and costs, U.S. environmental laws, some international laws, and trade-offs. So people are always concerned about environmental issues since uh, the publishing of the uh, famous Tragedy of the Commons paper that you did a paper on, which I will be grading hopefully part of the time I'm in Germany. Uh, so, you know, the paper came out in 1967, 1970s. We're getting a various number of anti-pollution policies. And it's made general good progress against a lot of things. Um, we've, we've cleaned up the waterways for the most part. And uh, the air to, to what's spewing out of factories has been cleaned. But we haven't, uh, there's two factors that have happened since then. Um, there's still high levels of pollution and water, air and water pollution because of the CO2 emissions uh, from automobiles and other things. We haven't really solved that. And number two, the runoff of high use of fertilizers in um, agriculture into rivers, streams, lakes, which cause those uh, blooms of red algae and things that you hear about because I think it depletes the oxygen and uh, makes it easier for the algae to breathe, but not so much for fish. So there's two things that we talk about, uh, and externalities are things that are um, a third party either benefits or suffers from something. A negative externality is a situation where a third party outside the transaction suffers from a market transaction. Pollution falls into this. A positive externality is a situation where a third party outside the transaction benefits from a market transaction by others. Uh, pollution, is, like we said, is definitely a negative externality. Additional external costs by third parties uh, outside the production unit of people that are polluting, be it agriculture or industry, uh, and their social costs. There could be health, um, longevity, all of those kinds of things. So taking social costs into account, if the firm uh, takes only its own production costs into account, then its supply curve will be S private. This one. Then it's, uh, and the equilibrium will occur at E0. So a certain amount of output and a certain price. Accounting for the additional external cost of $100 for every unit, uh, the firm's uh, supply curve will be the social supply curve. And the new equilibrium will be at E1, which is uh, 40,000 uh, units and a price of $700. Because, um, you know, there might be components in refrigerators that you just can't throw into a landfill and they have to be recycled or whatever. So it could be that kind of thing. A market failure is when the market on its own does not uh, basically allocate resource this is an efficient way that, to balance social costs and benefits. If firms were required to pay the social costs of pollution, they would create less pollution but produce less of the product and therefore charge a higher price. And that flies against this, um, the face of the free market and the practice of a free market, which is why people react against it. So. One of the things that governments can do instead of uh, going with this kind of uh, solution is command and control regulation. This is one type. The laws that specifically uh, limit the pollution that one can encounter, firms are required to increase their costs by uh, establishing, you know, putting in scrubbers for their uh, smokestacks and uh, account for the social costs of pollution and in deciding, therefore, how much to produce. Three difficulties with the command and control is regulation. No incentive to improve the quality of the environment beyond the set standard by the law. So there's no incentive really to do better. It's inflexible. It requires the same standard, usually of all polluters, subject of compromise in a political process. Everybody's trying to full of fine print, loopholes, exceptions, etc. And then enforcement is also difficult, depending on the kind of pollution it is. A pollution charge, a tax imposed on the quantity of pollution that a firm emits. So the worse you are, the more you have to pay. 
gives a profit maximizing firm an incentive to determine the least expensive technologies for reducing pollution. And firms can reduce pollution cheaply and easily will do so to minimize their pollution taxes. So one way you charge work to do this is you look at the marginal cost of reducing pollution. This is what economists will look at like this. And then they'll pick a charge where it seems reasonable for people to be able to invest. You want them to be able to do it. So if it's the cost uh, or price of this, if you set it at $1,000, we'll reduce by 30 pounds. Of course, we'd like to reduce 50 pounds of, of um, particle emissions, but the cost is uh, two and a half times that. So, and if it's only $2,500, it would be, okay, so what, let's, let's go for this $2,500 is not a, a lot, unless it's $2,500 a day, a month, or a year, but maybe it's $2.5 million to invest in that kind of equipment versus $1 million to do this. So you take small steps, you try to make the adjustments. So they look at curves like this and try to pick some place where uh, the incentive will be, it'll be less than you are taxing them to actually put the pollution controls in place. You have this cap and trade you hear about all the time too. It's a permit that allows a firm to emit a certain amount of pollution. If you reduce your pollution below that cap that you've been assigned, you can sell the balance to another company for money. So there's a in double incentive. Reduce pollution and also um, you can sell off your remaining uh, cap. So you can, if, if you don't hit, if you're under your cap, you can trade the cap off, you can sell it. Next is property rights. Legal rights of ownership on which others are not allowed to fringe without paying compensation. Uh, property rights are highly relevant in cases involved in endangered species or on privately owned land. Uh, the other thing is, you think about New York City, where they, se they s sell air rights. Uh, one externality would be as if everybody builds high-rise buildings in New York City, uh, the sun won't shine on many streets because some of the side streets are narrow. So they've come up with a plan and a scheme where they only allow so many high-rises per square foot and the number of uh, stories are dependent on what other buildings already exist around it. So you have these air rights. You could sell your air rights to someone else and therefore thereafter your property can only go up like two stories or three stories. It can't go 40 stories high. So that's another way of looking at that. Uh, the benefits of uh, environmental laws. So positive externality out of that. Uh, people stay healthier, live longer. I remember when I was in Detroit uh, growing up and a friends of ours lived near their Ford Rouge plant, the, 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 the largest automotive plant in the world at the time. And we would go there and have a Sunday dinner or, or a Sunday visit with these family friends. And uh, we'd come out and our car would be covered in a fine silt of ash from the, the foundry of the factory. It's crazy. And people were breathing that that lived around there. Uh, certain industries that rely on clean air and water, such as farming, fishing, and tourism, may benefit. Uh, when I used to go to Mexico City, the cleanest water in the city was at the Colgate factory. I could drink the water right out of the tap because they had to purify the water to uh, make toothpaste out of it because it was an ingredient in toothpaste. Property values will be higher. People may enjoy a cleaner environment in a way that does not involve market transactions. So they can uh, do the fishing, farming, and all that kind of stuff. So marginal benefits and marginal costs. Uh, the tools of margin analysis are always useful in economics because we're trying to optimize things. And that marginal analysis is basically the calculus value of all this. Reducing pollution is costly. Resources must be sacrificed. So the marginal costs of reducing pollution are generally increasing. The least expensive and easiest solutions can be made first, leaving the more expensive ones for later. Well, the marginal benefits of reducing pollution are generally declining. So, you know, you spend a lot, you spend a little and you can take a giant step in reducing pollution and then maybe the next step of reducing it by maybe half that amount costs three times as much. That's the kind of, of, of factors we're trying to look at. So if you have marginal cost and marginal benefits, you really want to look at where the two intersect. 
because you see the marginal cost uh, exponentially increases. So if you've reduced pollution by Q, you know, QA here, and then uh, for a little bit more cost, you can get to QB, but then to get to QC, it, you know, the cost starts to really increase and your benefits go down. So it's the same principle as a, you know, you have a, a Honda Civic versus a, a Mercedes C-Class. Uh, almost the same size is the Mercedes really two times better than the Civic or is it like 20% better, but you pay twice as much for it. It's that kind of thing. Uh, so as environmental protection increases, the cheap and easy ways begin to decrease, the marginal cost curve increases, and the marginal benefit curve tends to flatten out. So we're trying to find the sweet spot, and it's usually where marginal cost equals marginal benefits. Um, so at the point QC, the marginal cost is greater than the marginal benefits. At this level of environmental protection, you're not allocating resources efficiently, so it's forfeiting too many resources to uh, reduce pollution. So really you want to get to this point. And then obviously technology and um, people's preferences could take place and these curves of course could change over time. So this is at any one time that you want to look at this. So um, international. No nation itself can can do the carbon dioxide thing because uh, uh, everybody has to do it. So the fact that our government pulled out of it uh, recently is a little bit concerning. And the fact that we have this debate that, you know, is it good science, is it bad science? Um, who knows? I mean, that's for you to decide on yourself. I tend to think uh, we should be doing something about it and looking at these problems on an international basis and doing what we can in light of these kinds of curves to do the easy things. It's a good thing. So biodiversity is a full spectrum of animal and plant genetic material. Are we killing off things as a, a negative externality of using fertilizers and pesticides as killing bees, which are required to pollinate uh, the plants that produce everything that we eat that's fruit and vegetables. If you don't have bees, you can't, you know, you risk dramatically cutting the output, which is why you use fertilizers in the first place so, and, and pesticides in the first place. So where's the happy balance? Uh, so the international externalities that cross national borders and that a single nation cannot resolve, like the CO2 emissions. Um, The higher income companies certainly have been the primary contributors because they have the vast amount of industry, the vast amount of, of automobile ownership. That Paris Climate Agreement that you've probably heard about committed participating countries to significant limits on CO2 emissions and trying to get things going. As you know, I think we've recently pulled out of that, which hopefully with the next president we'll reconsider and do something more intelligent. My opinion, of course. The practical details of the international system and how it would operate across the borders are complex. Um, some sort of world government can impose a detailed environmental command and control regulation over the world, but the problem is, is that here you can't really enforce it because there is no form of world government that we have at this point that has that kind of control. Uh, so. We have a decentralized market-oriented approach, maybe the only practical way to uh, identify this. And maybe people are going to uh, have an incentive, therefore, to come up with solutions. So we have this trade-off between economic output and the environment. We'll generate a uh, production possibility frontier. Uh, economists think that an inefficient choice on a on that curve is undesirable. Market-oriented environmental tools provide sometimes a mechanism to um, get the same environmental protection at a lower cost 
or providing a greater de degree of environmental protection for the same cost. There's this thing, do you impose a regulation or do you let people figure it out on their own? Uh, if the profit mode is in place, it's harder to figure it out. So there has to be some incentive, I believe. So each society has to weigh its own values. Remember the production possibilities frontier, this, this, this curve that's not a budget line, and you want to find out where you want to be. We'll decide whether it wants a choice like P, where uh, it's very economic and a lesser impact on the environment versus a point like T where there's more, and then you of course have in between points. So you've got to figure out an inefficient choice such as M is undesirable because you want to be a net production possibilities frontier. You want to get the most benefit for whatever it is you're paying. So if you're paying this kind of output, you really want to get that value. Why would you want to pay this kind of output and get that value? So that's why it's inefficient. So that's quickly it. And uh, thank you for listening and do the homework for chapter, uh, this chapter, chapter 12. All right. Thank you.